Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. One of the most amazing things about both the human body and the science of medicine is when the two come together to do something we thought was impossible. Like cure HIV forever. We've been working on ways to stop this disease since the epidemic of the 1980s. And while treatments now are amazing, allowing many with HIV to live long, full lives, we've never really been able to defeat the virus itself. Except for just a few people who I would call lucky, but as you'll see, there's nothing lucky about the way they got rid of their diagnosis. Recently, a man dubbed the next Berlin patient became the seventh person to be totally cured of the disease. The story of how that happened is part ingenious scientific theory, part incredible coincidence, and honestly, it's a very strange twist of fate combined with decades of research. The question now, though, is how we go from seven people to seven million or 70 million. How do we turn a very rare and specific cure into another routine miracle of medicine? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Dr. Christian Gabler is a physician scientist and immunologist at the Charité Hospital in Berlin. He also recently presented data about the next Berlin patient. Hello, Dr. Gabler. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for finding some time for us. This is uh, a fascinating discovery, and I guess, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, not the first, but maybe you could, for those listeners who aren't familiar, take us back uh, to the original Berlin patient. Who was that, and why was that so significant? Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to. Um, so maybe let me lead in that all these cases and you mentioned correctly. So the, pa- the case that we just presented was um, what we believe now is the seventh case that has been cured of HIV. But when we look at the numbers um, and currently there is an estimate that roughly 40 million people are currently living with HIV. But when we look at the overall numbers since the start of the epidemic, um, the, the estimates are somewhere between 80 and 85 million people that either have been living or are currently living with HIV. So when you put this into perspective and then really count these numbers that we only have seven people, it it just shows you also how rare these cases are. And it it all started with the so-called first Berlin patient or Timothy Ray Brown. So this case was was extremely important because it really showed us for the first time that um, an HIV cure is possible. And so Timothy Ray Brown is is American actually, but he lived in, in Berlin for I think most of his professional life. And uh, Timothy Ray Brown received an, an HIV diagnosis in 1995 and several years later, uh, unfortunately, also received the diagnosis of an uh, acute myeloid leukemia, which is an aggressive form of blood cancer that requires um, more aggressive treatments like chemotherapy, irradiation. And in, in some cases, it also requires a, a stem cell transplant. And a stem cell transplant basically means is taking cells from another human being, a stem cell donor, uh, and, and replacing the, the hematopoietic cells, so the blood cells in the patient that, are, um, that have formed cancer, in this case, this type of blood cancer. And um, when Timothy Ray Brown required treatments for his, for his blood cancer, so the AML, there was a, a hematologist at the time here, also at Charité University Hospital in Berlin, uh, Dr. Giro Hüter was an oncologist um, by training and who, who took care of the treatment of uh, Timothy Ray Brown's uh, leukemia. But at the same time, he also um, had a, a, a theory or a hypothesis is that if Timothy would require a stem cell transplant, why not look for a donor who has a very rare mutation in his own blood cells that actually give resistance to HIV infection? And so basically, can we actually do two things uh, and maybe find a donor that not only has immune markers that are beneficial to treat the blood cancer, but also carries these very, very rare mutations and basically treat both things. And to, I think, everyone's surprise when Timothy Ray Brown then received the treatments, and um, these treatments are extremely risky, one must also say. So 
you can really die during these procedures because you need require chemotherapy. Many times you need um, irradiation. So they can really only be applied when you have this additional diagnosis of a cancer. But in this case, both Timothy Ray Brown's cancer could be treated with the stem cell transplant. And then when they both decided, Dr. Hüter and Timothy Ray Brown, then to stop taking um, the antiretroviral medication that this first burden patient was taking for his um, HIV diagnosis, they could also observe then uh, in the years after that they wouldn't see any activity of this virus, any HIV activity, which makes this case um, so unique. And I think we can probably discuss a little bit more about the biology and, and why this was successful and, and, and how, how, why we did see the rare cases that we're seeing. That is what I wanted to ask you, and I'm hoping you can explain it for somebody like myself who got a C in biology in high school and hasn't been back much uh, since then. Uh, what is it about this mutation that uh, makes it possible to eliminate HIV in a person uh, when their stem cells are transferred? I think to answer that, I, I actually have to take even a step further back um, and maybe explain a little bit about the biology of, of HIV in general. So HIV is what we call a retrovirus. What it needs to do is really infect the cell. So when it enters the cell, in the case of HIV, it's not only affecting, infecting any cell, but it's infecting immune cells. So the very cell itself that is actually meant to, to counteract viruses, bacteria in our immune system. However, um, HIV really needs these immune cells to replicate, so to, to build new copies of itself. And it does that in a way that once it enters the cell, the genetic information of this virus gets integrated into the genome, so into the genetic information of the host cell, so of this immune cell. And it can lie there and be integrated as what we call a proviral genome, so this genetic information of this virus is now encoded in the genetic information of this immune cell. Uh, and that makes it very hard for us and for, our, for the other immune cells that are not infected to really kind of detect these infected cells and eliminate them because this is what our immune system does, right? It recognizes foreign um, pathogens, so invaders, bacteria, and viruses. But because HIV is integrated into the genetic information of our immune cells, uh, it makes it extremely hard and extremely tricky. And what HIV needs then is to, to form new copies that can get reactivated. So these, these dormant um, proviral genomes can get reactivated and the host cell or the infected cell can be directed into a way that it produces new viruses actually and new viral particles that then can go on to infect new cells. In order to get into these types of immune cells, it requires co-receptors on the surface of these cells. And one of them is called CCR5. So it really is reliant on these co-receptors on the surface of these cells to actually enter and kind of start this viral life cycle. And what we know now is that a few individuals or like a, a small frequency of individuals that we do not even find uh, across the world, but we see higher frequencies, for example, in, uh, in, in Europe and Western countries. That's yet another question why we only find those there. There's different theories, but we do find roughly 1% of individuals that for example, are of European descent that carry these rare mutations that actually do not have these co-receptors on the surface. So these individuals, these really rare 1%, they did not inherit a functional copy of these co-receptors from both parents, both mother and father, do not express these co-receptors on the surface of their immune cells. The fact that they do not carry these co-receptors on the surface renders them resistant to an HIV infection. And in the case of Timothy Ray Brown, and uh, Dr. Giroita then went on to actually find a stem cell donor who was a match not only for these immune characteristics that you would need for the treatment of the blood cancer, this leukemia, but also find someone who, who belonged to this small group of people, to these 1%, uh, at least in, in, in Europe, that carried these um, two mutations. Basically, what Timothy Ray Brown then received was a new immune system that was resistant to an HIV infection. The next Berlin patient um, that you presented data on in July is different from the first and from most of the others who came before, right? Can you explain uh, simply if possible, you know, exactly what's different and why this is another step? 
So the second one was the so-called Munden patient. Uh, we had the Dusseldorf patient rather recently. We had uh, one female who's a New York patient. And we also last year had um, Paul Edmonds, who's the City of Hope, Hope patient. And then we had another case that was presented at the International AIDS Society conference um, last year in, in 2023, which is the Geneva patient. And we presented our case of the Berlin patient this year. And the difference in both these last two cases, the Geneva patient and our case, is that we have seen long-term remission. So remission means that we did not see HIV activity following stem cell transplantations. However, in both these cases, these immune cells that were transplanted did still carry functional co-receptors on the surface. However, it was still possible that we observed a long-term HIV remission for many years, in our case of the next Berlin patient, for now close to six years. And that makes these cases so interesting because for a long time, we thought that it was absolutely indispensable to have these CCR5 deficient transplants to not carry these co-receptors. But what we're seeing now in these last two cases, um, and that again gives us so much to think about as a scientist, to see that it's possible uh, following stem cell transplantation with functional CCR5 co-receptors makes these cases so unique and, uh, and interesting for us to study. How do you look at these results now and think about scaling this in a way that, I mean, obviously, just to be blunt about it, wouldn't require the patient getting a serious form of cancer in order to have this treatment? Exactly right. I mean, this is, this is where we need to, to move to when we want to think of something that is scalable and, uh, and something that we exactly have a treatment that does not have a, a mortality or a risk of dying from the treatment itself, which is close to 50%. So for me, what is so striking about our next Berlin patient is it has to do with these HIV reservoirs. And HIV reservoirs, these are these, the, this pool of cells that basically carry these dormant HIV genomes. So the genetic information that is lying there integrated into the, into the host genetic information is somewhat invisible for, for our immune system. And this is something that myself, but obviously the entire field that many people are, are really studying in depth. And it's these HIV reservoirs, so these dormant HIV proviral genomes that are really the, the biggest um, hurdle towards an HIV cure, because ultimately we would need to theoretically get rid of all of these latently infected cells, because even one cell that could produce new viral particles could start a new round of infection, infect new cells, and we would never come out of this, these vicious um, circles. So the idea that we're now seeing long-term, really like several-year-long HIV cures in individuals, although they did, do not carry these fully resistant new immune cells, that shows us that probably the process of the stem cell transplantation, but also this new immune system that's coming in from a stem cell donor, is in fact able to eliminate or at least reduce these HIV reservoirs in the patients following stem cell transplantation to a degree that makes it impossible for HIV to reactivate and cause a new round of infection. And this is something that really gives us a new angle and to think about this uh, more in depth. And I think it gives us proof that it is indeed possible to make a really biologically relevant impact on these HIV reservoirs and really um, impact them in a way that, that would allow for an HIV cure that is not only relying on these resistance mutations that we have. I'm sure that these resistance mutations on top of these impacts on the HIV reservoir help, but seeing it that even without this, it's possible to, to come into a, a situation of long-term HIV remission is really something that is unique and that we're just starting to see now. And that gives us hope that if we learn more about how we can influence this HIV reservoir, that we can come to other therapeutic modalities, other forms of really treating this and curing HIV that, that would be more scalable. Well, this is the last thing that I want to get at, which is uh, what kind of work is being done uh, on this method or other methods uh, around the world right now that could end uh, at a place where we can actually slap a label cure on it? Yeah, that's that's exactly the right question. And um, I, I, th I think I should also be careful not to, to overpromise because like you said, this is something that many people are working on. We're definitely not there. Uh, it's not around the corner, but just seeing these cases and learning from them, I think this is really 
what could get us there and I'm hopeful that we can achieve it. And so in terms of what is being done, I think it's really, it goes back to these, these HIV reservoirs. So a lot of work is being done on understanding in the case of chronic HIV infection. So in, in a person living with HIV, how these reservoirs are constituted, where can we find them? There's tissue reservoirs, so we know that there can be infected immune cells that are hiding in different tissues. How can we approach them there? How can we modulate them? So really thinking about therapies, any type of uh, intervention that could really affect these HIV reservoirs and also these biologically relevant reservoirs. So what HIV also does is it creates a lot of what we could maybe call viral um, trash almost. So it's genetic information that is not functional or does not have all the genetic information that it would need to, to form a functional, uh, an intact replication competent virus. Uh, but it almost serves as a decoy for immune response also. So what we really need to understand is these genetically intact proviral genomes, so the ones that are replication competent. And so really understanding where they are, what they do, and then finding a way of modulating them. This is um, what we're all trying to do. We've, we've been looking, so personally, I've been very much involved with studying broadly neutralizing antibodies. So antibodies, these molecules that our immune system or, or the immune system of a, a person chronically infected with HIV is able in, in certain cases to produce, but then using these broadly neutralizing antibodies as a way of um, a passive immunization, so uh, an intervention to modulate these HIV reservoirs, this is something that we're very much interested in uh, and we're studying right now to really try to understand how we can impact these HIV reservoirs. Dr. Gabler, thank you so much for this and thanks for explaining it so well. And uh, it's so nice to talk about uh, a hopeful story in medicine right now. Thank you for having me, Jordan. Dr. Christian Gabler of Charité Hospital. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always send us feedback on this episode or any other, especially if you have feedback on our themed week last week. We'd love to hear that. You can shoot us an email, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca, or you can pick up the phone and call us, 416-935-5935. This podcast is in every podcast player, and it's on your smart speaker. You just have to ask it to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.